Good. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we've had a session looking at people uh, during and shortly after doing a PhD. Uh, we've looked at the perspective of supervisors. We now have a session when we're looking at the, at the more concrete post-PhD uh, life with specific uh, sort of actions and plans that happened. Uh, Titus and Elise are going to hold the session, but please hold your questions after Titus's talk so we have a, a single Q&A session afterwards. That's it. That's it. Great. Thank you. Bonjour. Bon après-midi. D'abord, merci à toute l'équipe de l'ESAD. Uh, je suis très content uh, et très heureux de me retrouver de nouveau ici à Amiens chez Amis. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thanks for attending after lunch. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the ATAPI uh, organizing committee and all the volunteers for the work that I've put into this. Um, you're doing a great job for all of us. Um, I've entitled the my talk, Jack of All Trades, Master of None, uh, with a question mark. And what I'll try to do is to reflect a little bit on the circumstances in which many of us are operating. And what I'll try is I'll draw my personal experience and hope to be able to extrapolate some lessons, some insights that I, I hope are of are more generally applicable. Uh, I think there are two risks. Um, the one, the obvious one, is that all I can tell is very subjective and of no relevance to anyone else. The second one is that all I'm saying is um, stating the obvious. And from the conversations that we've had over the last few days, I do have a hunch that it's rather the latter. So that is me, um, more or less, some seven years ago. And that could be one of you, or that, or that. And uh, you're about to, or you have recently, come to the crowning triumph of many years of hard work. You've reached the pinnacle of your academic training. You have your PhD. So this means at least seven years of university education. But if you're from France or from the German-speaking world, and you probably didn't do all of your degrees in one go, but you had some breaks in between, you may be looking at some 10 years of higher education. That is <laughs> 10 years out of your life. So you may as well expect something from it. And a PhD may indeed enable you to do things. Traditionally, a, a PhD would be done by someone with an academic slash scientific career path charted out ahead of them. And for most people, this is still the case. So if you're in a humanities subject, there's a very good prospect to get a seasonal lecturer position that will hopefully be renewed every year, though that is not sure. You have plenty of undergraduate teaching to do, the preparation goes into it, the marking, a lot of admin work, and the expectation to deliver plenty of research impact and attract substantial amounts of external funding. All of this on an average income with little prospect of substantial increases as your career advances. If you're a natural scientist, you may get an assistance position in a lab with some 72-hour work weeks and even higher pressure to secure those research grants, make game-changing discoveries, publish about them and score impact points from leading journals that help you in turn to attract more funding. Luckily, this doesn't quite apply to you guys. You're more in this area, or so it seems at least to most outsiders. But we all know that you're actually more like this, only with a different hat on. And this puts you in, a, in an awkward spot. Awkward because this doesn't fit into established trajectories or widely known career path. You're a designer and a researcher, and it's not quite clear to most people what that means. And for us, uh, this situation may be challenging too. Am I a designer or am I an academic? What should I do with this coveted degree that took so many years that I could have used instead to develop my design portfolio? I really enjoy doing applied design work, but I also love the more cerebral challenges of research. Can I do both? Maybe, but if you had focused only on your academic interests, you would have a stack of publications, many more conference presentations, a better network in higher education circles, 
and therefore much better chances of securing this assistant professor position or high profile research grant or that tenure track professorship. And vice versa, if you had concentrated on your design work, you would have a much more impressive portfolio, an established client base, maybe founded a company, and probably you would have a much more favorable balance on your bank account. Maybe some people manage to do both, but chances are that you cannot maintain both activities on equally high levels. So some things will get compromised or we'll have to go entirely. <laughs> so what you probably end up with is a small portfolio with work of low visibility, irrespective of its quality, and maybe some design award. On the academic side, you may have some publications that are not widely recognized for their academic or scientific standing, and some part-time teaching. In other words, you will be hard pressed to compete for the same jobs with your colleagues who spent their entire careers developing their professional credentials. And equally, you will also have a hard time securing traditional academic positions because your peers have many more publications. And as we all know, that's all that counts. Moreover, in practice, any choices that you may want to make will of course depend on the opportunities available. And there may only be some. There are only so many design research positions, so some design graduates with a PhD will end up running their own design practice or seek employment in a larger design office. A model that has been quite common is to combine design practice with some teaching, typically in an art school like here in Amiens. Yet others may actually be able to combine design, practice, teaching and research. And it comes at a workload that is difficult to fathom. Um, but then there is also that other thing that I haven't mentioned yet, and it rarely features any kind of, in any kind of career plan. It's called life. Because as you engage in all these activities, you may actually meet someone. Let's call him George. And you may hit it off well and fall in love. So now you have a relationship to foster next to your professional activities, not to mention friends and families. And as this is 2020, and the person that is not from your village is likely to be way more interesting than your neighbor, things get more complicated. George may be from somewhere else, or a job prospect that you or he wants to pursue is not where you are based. So it may well be that your relationship needs you to move in order for it to continue and to thrive. So you may move to a different city or to a different country, or you may indeed move around the world. <laughs> and whilst you are very happy to make some sacrifices for your relationship to work, this will also have a tangible impact on your activities. And the first thing that goes out is teaching, which cannot really be done remotely, and it may just not be available in your new home. That leaves you with research and practice. But although you can pursue some research independently, most of the time it will be bounced to some kind of institutional framework, eventually leaving only your design work, which you can pursue most independently. So now you have happily settled into your new situation, your relationship works, and having done all of these things, you are now also of an age in which something else might come into play. <laughs> and you all know what's coming. Now, this <laughs> is a game changer, and as I know, some in the audience can attest to. It won't get easier from here on to make anything work, let alone master it. From here onwards, for at least a few years, or a few more, or more. <laughs> the name of the game is compromise, not excellence. And that's just life. It may not apply to everyone, be that as it may. In either scenario, things add up and you find yourself juggling more and more activities that compete for your time and energy. You are a partner, a parent, a designer, a researcher, a teacher, an academic, an entrepreneur, an artist, you name it. And it is here at the very latest 
that you have become a jack of all trades. And it is in the very nature of finite resources and the resulting compromises that you'll also be a master of none. This may, a bit this may a bit disheartening. After all, we are trained to excel. No one ever tells you, you should just be good enough. Mastery is expected, just as a five-star rating on Amazon. Who is going to buy a three-star rated item? Well, today I would like to make a case for the jack of all trades. Because whilst you may not be a master of everything, you can still be pretty good at the things that you do. For what is it that has put you in that position in the first place? Interest in more than one subject, a multitude of talents, a wide range of skills, the ability to engage different topics and audiences, and as a result, a broader range of experiences. For all I can see, these are not shortcomings, but qualities. And as I'm going to discuss now, sometimes being a jack of all trades may actually work to your advantage. In March 2018, I was approached by Professor Alison Black of the department in Reading, uh, whether I would be interested in applying for Marie uh, Sklodowska uh, Curie Fellowship, excuse the butchering of the co Polish name. At that time, I had been out of higher education for almost four years. And although I had published a book the year before with Brill, with precious little reaction from the academic world, I was busy with commercial work and I had plenty of ideas to go ahead, so there was very little incentive for me to change things. But then, that part of me that wears the funny hat came back in. And I started reading about what had been published since I had completed my PhD and thinking about what I could propose as a research project. And the further I advanced, the more interesting it appeared. Eventually, I felt like I might, I might as well give it a go. There's nothing lost trying. Which is, by the way, how all of my so-called career decisions came about. And after all, the MSCA sounded pretty good. They support researchers at all stages of their careers, regardless of age and nationality. So anybody can apply from anywhere. Uh, researchers working across all disciplines are eligible for funding. It's a completely bottoms-up approach, and um, even disciplines as obscure as ours may get funding. The MSCA also support cooperation between industry and academia and innovative training. And that's the jack of all trades bit. Um, it's not purely research for research sake, but there's a strong emphasis of doing something with it. So what I ended up with is I developed two routes of investigation and I proposed them to the department uh, in mid-June 2018. They liked them and they liked one better than the other, and so we decided to develop the proposal on this basis. My wife, by the way, was very supportive. She said from the very beginning that I wouldn't get it and that I shouldn't waste too much time on the application. <laughs> so she kept me grounded. Um, <laughs> and being my wife, of course she was right, um, at least regarding how much time it would take. For what I hadn't realized was that the first draft had been the fun part, and now came the work. As a review after a review came in, it dawned on me that the one thing that could be lost were my holidays. More and more people got involved and generously used their time to provide valuable feedback and questioned every idea, phrase, and word of the document, and the process took the better part of my summer. I'd never written a funding application like this before, and for the purpose of my argument here, I would like to delve a little bit into the details of the proposal. So when you apply for one of the MSCA um, fellowships, you have to use a template, and um, this template is structured into three sections uh, that are stuffed with very bureaucratic jargon, and um, if we look at the first part, excellence, and this, the first subsection, you can readily appreciate how you can use your practice to demonstrate a quite important criterion. Because a researcher, designer, 
is by definition multidisciplinary. You can make a case for that. The quality of the host, the training and the supervision are somewhat of a different story. But when it comes to showing professional maturity and independence, a record of accomplishments outside of an institution may actually be a benefit. The second bit is impact, and impact is often very difficult for research in the humanities. As my colleague Rob Banham pointedly said, it is awfully difficult to show how research into 19th century chromolithography improves the lives of people today. But if your research can feed into practice, it can also benefit your, your future career after the fellowship and outside academia. So subsection 2.1, tick. You can design your research in such a way that you can exploit the project results in your design practice and can fin find ways to disseminate the results among your peers. 2.2, check. And finally, many of us come from a background or training as communication designers. So we should give any other academic a run for the money when it comes to communicating our work. 2.3, check. Turning to the last section, implementation, there are also obvious advantages for a practitioner. Because if you have worked as a designer, you are familiar with work plans, project schedules, and workloads that are manageable. This, again, is a skill that can be shown in an application for a research grant. If you have worked with teams, the allocation of tasks and resources should not be too alien. And you can claim these experiences for your proposal. Of course, there are other bits that also have to go into it, and it's a team effort to put something together. Uh, it's not to say that it's going to be easy. Um, the resulting, there, is a, there's a, there was a limit of 10 pages, and uh, it was very difficult to cram everything in there, and the resulting document was extremely dense because it had to provide the rationale for the project, show the qualities of the researcher and the host, articulate the research plan and the methodology, and demonstrate how the research findings will eventually be disseminated and brought to application. But eventually, by mid-September, we were able to submit the proposal for Typo Arabic. And to be very honest, at this point, all I wanted to do was to get on with my work, and pretty much forgot about the application for the coming month. And again, this is a luxury that you can only afford if you are lucky enough to have more than one interest and more than one possible occupation. Yet, in February 2019, I heard from the EU Commission that I had made it through the assessment and that I was awarded the fellowship. And it was only at this point that I realized how competitive it had been. So it was a nice achievement. To finish, I would like to share some of the comments from the evaluation report that I think neatly demonstrate how beneficial it can be to pursue and foster interests, skills and accomplishments in more than one domain. Number one, the researcher's work outside of academia was also connected to the topic of the proposal, which could play a very positive role in resuming their scholarly career. Two, the proposal convincingly outlines the possible commercialization of the action's result. And point three, the online presence, which is emphasized as the main measure to communicate project activities to a non-academic public, is very credible, as the researcher has considerable experience in online products. So on this note, I'd just like to finish and say here's to all of you, Janes and Jacks of all trades, who are good at more than one, you rock. Thank you.